Good evening. I want to welcome you all to the Civil Rights Memorial Center. I am Taffany English, director of the Civil Rights Memorial Center. Um, I really do appreciate you taking time out of your schedule on a Monday night to come out to the voter rights panel, which is the first of a two-day event commemorating the 30th anniversary of the Civil Rights Memorial. Um, speaking of the Civil Rights Memorial, I always like to begin there with the memorial because of what the memorial means and what it signified at the time that it was dedicated in 1989, 30 years ago. It was the first memorial of its kind dedicated to everyday ordinary people who lost their lives um, in the fight for civil rights. Most of them, um, actually 12 of them, who are inscribed on the memorial were fighting um, for voting rights. And we know uh, that voting rights is under attack today. And so we saw it befitting to start the two-day celebration uh, commemoration with a voting rights panel. So again, thank you all for being here. So tonight, um, I just want to introduce our panelists. I'll introduce them by name and organization. And after I do that, each panelist will provide an overview of the work that they're doing with regard to voter rights. So we'll start with Nancy Abudu, who is the Deputy Legal Director of the Voting Rights Legal Practice Group with Southern Poverty Law Center. We have Kanisha Brown, who is a community activist uh, and advocate and ally with Rolling to the Polls, a grassroots uh, organization, a grassroots initiative. And then we have Nora Cross with OLA. So with that, I'll start with Nancy, if you can just tell us um, who you are, what work you're doing. Sure. Three minutes, Nancy. Okay, no. three minutes. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you very much for being here. And those on the uh, looking at us Facebook Live, we appreciate your participation as well. Again, I am the Deputy Legal Director for Voting Rights for the Southern Poverty Law Center. We're a brand new practice group or addition to SPLC. We really started in February of this year in part because the organization recognizes that as the Supreme Court has held, voting rights really is the foundational right when it comes to the exercise of all other rights. So when we talk about immigration reform and criminal justice reform, access to more than just adequate education, all of those issues are influenced by policy, that are influenced by our politicians, and really at the end of the day should be influenced by us as voters who are putting people in positions of authority to make sure that our interests are re represented and properly reflected in the policies under which we're currently living. And so at the end of the day, that's what SPLC's Voting Rights Practice Group is about. It's about connecting the dots to make sure that the issues that are really affecting the social fabric of our society are reflected in such a way that the voters really understand that we have to play an important, active role in making sure that we're dictating the outcomes in our society. And so at SPLC, we're doing that through what I call integrated advocacy. Of course, we'll continue doing the litigation because the fight in the courts remain. Um, we are dealing with serious areas of voter suppression that are just direct assault when it comes to the exercise of the fundamental right to vote. But we're also going to be using our policy and our public education arm to be more on the offensive. There are policies when it comes to election administration and other reform that we don't enjoy in places like Alabama or Mississippi, like no excuse absentee voting or early voting or progressive rights restoration or reenfranchisement scheme so that we don't have the significant number of people who lose their right to vote in many cases permanently simply because of a criminal conviction. And then finally, as I wrap up, of course, not just for 2020, but for the years beyond in terms of really mobilizing voters, working in partnership with organizations that are already doing this work, lifting their voices as well as the voices of the most marginalized communities in our society. So thank you again for having me. Thank you, Nancy. Kanisha? Okay. 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I see some familiar faces that I know. Uh, to the SPLC, thank you for having me. Um, to provide like a brief overview of the Rolling to the Polls voting initiative, this was something that was started back in 2016 um, in, during the presidential election. Uh, we actually kind of started around informally watching the presidential debates, and you know, we were just jokingly saying, okay, we need to do something about <laughs> uh, getting people motivated to vote. And as the days went on, we really became more serious about informing people who look like us to get more engaged about voting. So um, what we did at that time, we started pulling election data from surrounding areas. And what we did, we identified areas that had um, a routine low voter turnout. And when I say low voter turnout, they averaged probably about 20% or below. And then once we started further dissecting um, those voter precincts in those areas, they were pretty much marginalized communities. So from that point, we just really just basically just started going door to door, knocking on doors, asking people first were they registered to vote, did they know about an upcoming election, did they have any issues with voting, and most importantly, you know, had they lost their rights due to a felony conviction. Um, during the time that we began this initiative, this was also during the time where Governor Kay Ivey also put into law the updated more turpitude law, which actually kind of streamlined convictions, disqualifying convictions to probably like roughly 44 convictions, and a lot of them rolled off. And, you know, something that was kind of profound during that time was Anybody that committed a felony conviction, of course, once you get convicted, you know of the rights that you no longer have. So when the law went into place in May 2017, no one was notified that they could possibly get their voting rights restored. So we also kind of made sure that we set up voter restoration um, clinics to get people um, back registered to vote, and we just simply went out into the neighborhoods to let people know that had felony convictions that, hey, you could go through a process to get your voting rights restored. Or if you have something as simple as a drug felony conviction, you can simply go to the board of registrars to vote. Um, so those were some of the things that we did during that time. And we decided to just kind of keep going with it. Um, 2016 personally did not turn out the way that I wanted it to. Um, but it did also motivate us to kind of keep going. We also kind of focus on the national things um, all the time, but we never pay attention to the local issues. And, you know, to me, sometimes local politics is more important than what we see on a national scale. So this is just something that we kind of continue going um, for every election cycle, and uh, we're still doing it now and keeping the momentum going into 2020. And I, I guess I should say, going back to the name of the initiative, Rolling to the Polls, one of the things that we also specialize in is transporting people who do not have transportation access to the voting polls to make sure they get a ride to vote and we take them back home. Thank you, Kanisha. Mm -hmm. Nora? Well, I'm Nora Cross. I am part of Hispanic Outreach Leadership and Action. We are a really young organization here in Montgomery. We have been working only for one year. And uh, our main purpose is to empower, connect, and educate the Hispanic community in Montgomery and the River Region. And uh, well, about voting rights, we have a really complex situation. Um, to me, like it is great to be here because I am. I think something important is that I am a legal resident, so you have to know that I am not uh, able to vote. And I represent a large population of Hispanics that can't vote, but it, that doesn't mean that we don't have a civic uh, activity or civic life. And actually, that is pretty important because the Hispanic um, community can turn out the elections on 2024, 2028. And the Hispanic community in Alabama is very different from the Hispanic community in Florida, in San Francisco, in Chicago. So it is a very interesting um, population. Our main focus right now is to educate the second generation of immigrants because uh, we have um, large community of undocumented people that are not receiving uh, civic education. So uh, the Hispanic community functions a lot in, I repeat what my parents uh, did. So if the parents uh, don't vote, the Hispanics, uh, the second generation are not going to vote. 
So um, our task right now is complex. Uh, we have to work a lot in the ground, but well, we are still building uh, that path. And thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all for sharing what um, your thoughts are, your passion, and, and moving us forward. And that's why we're here. Um, I know the first time that I was able to vote, right? You wait for that moment where you're able to go and register to vote and you're voting. And of course, I grew up where that was something that was just ingrained in me. I always knew that I would be a voter, even when, you know, we knew the climate was different, right, or it, or it was rocky. And so for me, voting is essential. Like, it's a necessity. It's like waking up every morning to get a shower. It's necessary. And so I wanted each of you to talk a little bit about uh, kind of what it means to be a voter um, and why have we seen, um, so, and Kanisha, you talked about this too, like the voter apathy um, when you first started um, on the ground with rolling to the polls. Like, what is it that we you know, as a community can do um, as far as mobilizing and educating and I guess stressing again just the fundamental right and the necessity of voting and what it means to our community. Okay. Um, and like Taffany said, um, when we first started going out into neighborhoods knocking on doors, um, we did witness a little bit of voter apathy. And a lot of it came from that just people weren't engaged. Um, a lot of times, you know, of course, and I'm pretty sure all of us can be a witness to this, when election season comes around, um, those who are seeking office, you see them all the time on TV, on radio, um, throwing things for your community and, you know, knocking on your doors. And once they're voted in or whatever happens, you no longer see them anymore. And uh, one conversation that kind of stuck to me as we were going out of neighborhoods, I was talking to a young gentleman, and he didn't want to vote, he didn't care to vote. And when asked why he didn't want to vote, he was like, what's the point of me electing the same elected official when I haven't seen a quality of life change since I've been here? And this was something that, this was a person who represented his um, area for at least 30 years. So, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to, you know, convince someone that you still need to vote, your voting is important, um, moving forward and you know sometimes I kind of give them a little of that analogy when they are apathetic about voting I was like well do you play the lottery and you know sometimes they'll look at me crazy and like yeah I do and I was like well did you win the last time you played the lottery and you know <laughs> they're like no I said but you still go and play the lottery again right mm -hmm. and you know they'll look like yeah and I said like, you know sometimes voting is pretty much like playing the lottery Sometimes you kind of bank on that person getting into office and you vote for that person. Sometimes they may kind of do what you want them to do. Sometimes they don't. But you still have to go make your voice heard, hoping that the next person that you select, they will represent, you know, your area or it's a way to hold your person accountable. So um, I don't think apathy is as big as people like to let on because I'm, and I'm kind of an optimist. I believe that the more that you educate the electorate, mm -hmm. the more engaged that they will be. And I've noticed that some people that we've gone to and engaged and just kind of convinced them to vote by us keeping in touch with them, hey, just letting you know there's an election coming. Um, do you need a ride to the polls? You know, anything that we can help you with, they stay engaged. Mm -hmm. And some people that have, that were apathetic before are now more routine voters just because we went in, came to them with a smile, because we engaged them with a conversation. I think that's kind of very helpful in today's society right now because we get so busy and so self-consumed with things that we don't normally, you know, step away from our cell phones to have a conversation with a person. So, you know, just by simply engaging people, I think they can also brings them back into the voting process. Okay. Nancy? Sure. Well, I would echo a lot of what Kanisha said, I think, for sure. In well, number one, that apathy is not just limited to voters. Mm -hmm. I think there's a level of apathy that we're seeing within elected officials as well who mm -hmm. get in, even if they are new to the political landscape, and then they get in and they become part of the machine, and then they themselves mm -hmm. feel like they can't really change it in the revolutionary way a lot of people would like to see, and perhaps the reason why they were elected in the first 
first place, and then they become part of the problem. And then we, we get roped into that because then it translates into voter apathy because we don't see a change in the people that we elect. So I would say one possible solution is just increased accountability for those who are actually elected. And what does that look like? Um, for midterm elections where some folks are only in office for two years, that's a shorter window, which means that the stakes are higher for them to actually produce some positive results. For those who are in power longer, um, in terms of four or six year terms, then there is a level of kind of checks and balances that perhaps need to be put in place during their term. So I think, again, government accountability, transparency, as well as dealing with incumbency, mm -hmm. which is a problem. I mean, there are a number of places where people don't participate because there is no competition. This one person is running. That person has been in power for decades or for sure years. And so people get the sense that their vote really doesn't matter in those kinds of elections. So how can we make certain races more competitive to encourage people to participate and then really see that their vote does matter? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Nancy. And, and Nora, you, you brought up something interest, interesting in your um, conversation mm -hmm. about the difference in the generations mm -hmm. and the repeating of what the generation before done mm -hmm. and the need for civic education now. How do you think that that will change, um, specifically because you're working in Montgomery mm -hmm. in the Deep South? What are you noticing um, with regard to uh, the enthusiasm or the eagerness, or is it something that is desired um, in the Hispanic community? Um, well, the Hispanic community in Montgomery is very isolated. So, so far we haven't noticed eagerness to participate in politics or the civic uh, life. Um, I think that one of the challenges beside the, besides the apathy is also the fear to provide information, mm -hmm. which is going to be one of the challenges on like the census. Yes. that you, they don't want to provide information because they consider they are going to be a, a target. target, And um, well, also to register as a voter, they have to provide certain, certain data that may cause fear and may like take them away for, from, the, from the vote. So the um, second generation, as I was mentioning, they are citizens, they are participating in the educational life, they are getting jobs, and they are also afraid to cause a problem to their families mm -hmm. if they are open about their thoughts in, in uh -huh. politics. Uh -huh. So. I don't see right now that the politicians are really interested in addressing the problem. Mm -hmm. They are only, they have like the urgency to, I want to check this box of including the Hispanic community, so can you get me votes? Mm. No, I cannot, because one, as organization, I am not going to uh, support one or another party, and the we have a population that right now cannot make a difference here in Montgomery, but that is something that needs to be built uh, with the years. Uh -huh. So, uh, yes. Okay. So this this leads me to another question. Um, you know, and, and all of you touched on it about politicians who uh, have a stronghold on positions and locally how that looks. I'm really, uh, you know, we can talk about national, but really let's look at Alabama, specifically the Deep South. And I know for me, um, growing up, as long as I've been old enough to know, I think Shelby's been in office, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and just even with name recognition, like I hear some of my family members don't know anything of his platform, not, don't know anything about how he'll provide assistance to rural communities. I grew up in a rural community, uh, but because it's just name recognition. Um, so talk a little bit about um, how that impacts voters and the way in which they vote. So I'll start with Kanisha. <laughs> um, that's something that's kind of frustrating and fascinating at the same time. Uh, what I've noticed a lot in local elections, um, and we can kind of briefly talk about the recent municipal election, mm -hmm. um, 
Montgomery has never really had um, a city council that has had more than one woman um, on the council. And I know at that time, during the, the recent election cycle, I think there was roughly five women that ran for city council. And some of them were very viable candidates. Um, and, you know, not to really pick sides about the candidates or not, but I am thinking about one particular district race well, you had one candidate who was a woman who was actively canvassing, actively engaging voters, actively campaigning against an incumbent who has been an incumbent for probably um, close to 15 years um, that lost by, I think, five votes. Six. Six, six votes. Up. And, you know, comparing the tenacity of that campaign and the other one, the other one just simply just kind of had people passing out door hangers um but people voted for and you know at the end of the day your vote is your right that's your choice right. but i think people just really voted strictly for that name recognition because sometimes voters just feel comfortable by a name that they recognize um of course when we come across political newcomers you know they'll you know of course we're like well who are they where do they come from who sent them what do they represent but sometimes we also don't hold the people that have been in office forever, we don't hold them accountable with those same questions. What have you done in these past years? Have you benefited my area since you've been in office? What have you been doing since you've been holding that seat? And I think we need to kind of be fair in terms of, you know, political newcomers as well as incumbents. I don't think we do, and when I say we as an electorate, sometimes even me myself, I don't think we do a good job in holding our current um, elected officials accountable. Mm -hmm. So I think that we need to do um, a better job about that. And it also kind of goes back to voter education. If we kind of better understand what those roles and responsibilities are of certain elected officials, I think that we will, you know, better discern who to keep in office and who to vote in. Nancy, do you want to Sure. Well, we SPLC is also a 501c3 organization, nonpartisan, when mm -hmm. we don't have a dog in the fight in terms mm -hmm. of who gets elected, just making sure that whoever is elected really is the candidate of choice for the majority of people who participated in that election. And so I think when you talk about name recognition, you're also talking about the ability to raise money, mm -hmm. fundraising, yeah. yes. which is something yes. that newcomers or younger candidates struggle with and then especially you tack on the gender issue in terms of female candidates just mm -hmm. simply not being able to raise mm -hmm. the same amount of money as their male counterparts so that contributes because we know that elections are extremely expensive even at the local level you have some mm -hmm. county commission seats that are going in terms of the amount of money needed to raise just to run a viable campaign in the hundreds of thousands for a county commission seat who can really compete in that playground? Not very many. Um, and then in terms of local elections, I would say that we probably need to talk more about the significance of local elections because that is where people see the Im direct impact in terms of their daily lives of what their city council and county commissioners are doing. And mm -hmm. so really trying to make that push at the local level, again, help people connect those dots and and then lift that up to the federal level is one strategy. Can, can I add something yes, sure. to something that you just said about how it's hard for newcomers and, you know, gender specific to raise money? Um, if you kind of recollect back to the 2017 election for Doug Jones, um, when Doug Jones won, there were, you know, accolades given to the black electorate, um, specifically black women, mm -hmm. um, for that victory. And it kind of prompted something that was new in Alabama. We had roughly over 70 black women that ran for office going into the statewide election, which, you know, received, you know, national news and things like that. But when it came to the June primary on June 5th, of those 70 candidates, more than half of those did not survive that primary. And going into the general election in November, maybe out of those 70 candidates, we probably had roughly nine that won office. And I'm saying that to say, you know, we kind of glorify um, women candidates and black, you know, 
women candidates to run for office, but we don't have that support financially or, you know, physically. I know that a lot of those candidates kind of struggled with getting, you know, outreach. And Alabama is kind of funny when it comes to politics. We'll support people from the back end, <laughs> but we won't fully come out and support because we don't want people to know or anything like that. So it, w it was kind of weird to see, you know, all these women run for office. And, I mean, I'm just talking about black women when you include all women um, in that election cycle. It was well over 100. And I know a lot of those women did not get supported because it goes back to, well, I don't know much about you. I don't know what you're going to do. So uh, that's yeah. something that really needs to be mm -hmm. discussed moving forward. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Mm -hmm. Very good point. So, um, Nora, did you want to add anything to that? Mm -hmm. Well, Since that... you laid it off. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that uh, 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 for the Hispanic community, it will be difficult to also go for the name recognition like uh, one of the challenges that we have is also language access and since mm -hmm. most of the candidates don't provide information in spanish or some other languages yeah. that are also part of um like mixed tech or mam or languages that are spoken in central and south america they don't have like really information and unless they have a translator or interpreter that is able to communicate that it, there's not a lot of connection with a candidate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So w we'll, we'll shift gears just a little bit um, and I want us to talk about voter suppression. Hmm. And we know um, six years ago the um, Air, uh, Shelby v. Holder um, Supreme Court case basically gutted um, voting rights, and we know we, we, we are we're moving in the right direction because just a few days ago there was an introduction to overhaul um, that. So when we look at voter suppression, specifically in marginalized communities, and how voter suppression affects people of color, so we're looking at very strict voter ID laws here in Alabama, um, citizenship questions in Alabama, um, redistricting um, and purging people from uh, voter roles. And I know that's a lot. So I, I want each of you to spend some time um, on this. I won't, you know, okay, not 10 minutes, but <laughs> not three either. But I want you to talk about um, voter suppression and what that has done um, in our communities, how it's impacted, um, and you mentioned earlier, Nancy, how voting affects things like housing, education, economic development, and um, specifically in the Deep South, what has voter suppression um, done in communities? And we'll start with you, Nancy. Sure. Well, you're right. In 2013, when the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a very key provision of the Voting Rights Act, and there were two. There was one known as Section 5, which requires federal approval for any voting change in a jurisdiction that has a history of voter discrimination. And unfortunately, but not surprisingly, Alabama was covered in toto. The whole state was covered under Section 5. And what happened in 2013 with the U.S. Supreme Court's decision is they struck down the coverage formula that then trigger, triggers the Section 5 preclearance requirement. So all of a sudden, Alabama was no longer required to seek that approval because we're now living supposedly in a post-racial society. And so we don't need the extra protections of things like the Voting Rights Act anymore because everything is all good now. Um, and so what you saw immediately after Section 5's essentially destruction was a place like Alabama implementing a photo ID law for the first time, requiring people to show a very limited one of a very limited list of acceptable photo identification solely for the purposes of voting. You saw Texas, which had already tried this multiple times without any success under Section 5, once the Supreme Court issued its ruling 
photo ID in Texas became the, the law. You saw, again, proof of citizenship. All of a sudden, people had to attest to their citizenship because the non-existent problem of voter fraud was so somehow important that now you had to provide this additional proof in order to exercise your fundamental right to vote. So what does this mean? It means that people have been discouraged and in some ways outright prevented from being able to participate in our democracy, which means, again, for me, you know, important mm -hmm. talking about connecting the dots, which means that our education systems in, in many communities are just failing. They are failing our children. Our children are not being educated. They're not being protected. And they really are being placed on a pipeline straight to prison. It means that people cannot afford housing, despite the amount of construction that's happening in many cities like Atlanta, Charlotte, um, places in Texas, regular folks can't afford to live there because those houses are not being built for them. And so what happens, an increase in homelessness, an increase in people living below the poverty line, all of this is what voter suppression spawns. And so that's why, again, for SPLC, we want to make sure that people understand really what's at stake if they decide that they're not going to vote or if they decide that they're not going to uh, push back against all of the efforts that we're seeing. Thank you. Um, Kanisha, if you can speak um, to voter suppression, and I know we look at rolling to the polls as grassroots mm -hmm. um, organizing and on the ground, and just in response to um, the um, Supreme Court decision, we saw a lot of on the ground movement. We saw um, organizations building and moving back toward that grassroots model. Uh, talk a little bit about the momentum that that has brought and how um, that's in response to voter suppression. Okay. Um, well, first, let me just start by going back to the statement that, you know, they want to strip all of these things under the Voting Rights Act because we are in a post racial society. And my counter to that is that if voting wasn't so important, they wouldn't really work so hard to take those rights away from people. Um, what we've noticed on the ground, um, sometimes we kind of, the things that we have, are we, we think that you know they're necessities on us. They're easy to assess, like your driver's license or ID. There are a lot of people still here in Alabama, even in Montgomery, especially in more like the rural parts, that do not have direct access to an actual ID. Um, some of them probably have, you know, fines or fees or a conviction that kind of puts a little fear in them from going to go through the process of getting an ID. And to me, that's a form of suppression. Um, I also feel like it's a form of, su of suppression to give out incorrect dates on things in terms of as far as like an election. So we've seen that a lot and a lot of things that we think are kind of normal and routine um, and we think that people are supposed to have it because even I had a conversation with a person who actually looked like me, you know, saying I don't see the big deal. Everybody should have an ID. Why is so everybody making a big, uh, big you know, ruckus about it? And I'm like, not everybody have access or know how to go and get a non-driver ID. No one knows that they can get a state issue ID if they do not have a driver's license. Some people don't have a driver's license and feel like because they do not have a driver's license, they can't go and vote. So that form of suppression is going on. I feel that um, felony disenfranchisement is mm -hmm. also a very big piece of voter suppression, especially with our current Secretary of State not really doing to me, an ample job of notifying people with felony convictions that they can go through the process to vote. And we've seen that a lot even to this day. Um, that law went into place 2017, and it's still to this day we're talking to people that do not know that they can get their voting rights store, restored. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had a gentleman who had a drug conviction from 30 years ago who mm -hmm. registered to vote um, for this past election cycle. And before we engaged him back in March, he never had any idea that he could actually go and vote. And his frustration was, was that he paid his debts to society, he paid his fines, he's living as a normal citizen, but he felt less of a person, felt less of a human being because he could not cast his 
vote for any election. He missed his chance to vote for president in any other election that they've had in the past 30 years. And when we told him that you don't have to go through a process, all you gotta do is just fill out a voter registration form. He did it that day. And the weekend before the last election we had, he called me and told me, hey, I got my voter card, I'm going to vote. Mm -hmm. And although that may seem small because that's one person, but that's one person that's more involved in the electorate because we engaged them. Right. And I'm saying that to say, just imagine if the state of Alabama did a nationwide, I mean, not a nationwide, a statewide campaign mm -hmm. to notify these people that have felony convictions that saying that you can go and vote. Um, roughly over 100,000 people, that can just totally shift in election. Montgomery has roughly 4,000 people who have felony convictions that were disenfranchised from voting. That can totally shift an election. And I kind of feel, and it's just personally me speaking, feel that that's really by design. So. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and you bring up another, uh, uh, I think we're hearing this repeated, how much, in, how much education, educating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the community about voting rights, voter mm -hmm. restoration, getting mm -hmm. registered to vote, mm -hmm. knowing what the laws are in your state. Mm -hmm. um, and then you sharing about the young man, it actually made me remember um, Desmond Mead in Florida, mm -hmm. um, who actually mobilized on the ground to um, help reinstate over one million um, people with felony convictions their right to vote. And there's a short documentary about Desmond, and um, he's going to try to vote, and he can't and he breaks down in tears. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about him, I'm a big crybaby, so, and that, that just did something to me, mm -hmm. but we were actually fortunate, to, he actually brought a group here, and I just met him by happenstance. Mm -hmm. And we see that a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, that signifies just how critical, how important the vote is and what it means to um, specifically marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. and. This would this actually leads to a question that I have farther down, but I'll ask it now. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the racial anxiety that motivates voter suppression. Um, Kanisha, you made a statement that you feel it's by design. Mm -hmm. Can do you feel? Uh, can you elaborate more on that? Um, when I feel things are by design, I think that in terms of marginalized communities. I feel like sometimes with white supremacy in a sense, if they feel that there are more people that are united together to make their voices heard, sometimes people are fearful of that. And I think they sometimes work a lot to push those powers against people. And that's why I say it's kind of by design because you know, it makes you kind of wonder in a sense. Well, why hasn't anyone taken the time to talk to, you know, people who were disfranchised? Why haven't people taken the time to go into communities to speak, you know, to people about the importance of voting? Why do we not have a fair and, you know, accessible way to the ballot for everyone that's, you know, in the voting process? And, you know, I just see that a lot. I know in terms of people who are, and I mean, it's not just with, race, also with class. Mm -hmm. um, when people are in more privileged um, environments, they have that access to do pretty much anything they want to do with voting. If they move, you know, they know how to update their information. They know to have their photo ID. But I notice with more marginalized communities, that information is lacking. And that's where, you know, grassroots organizations like Rolling to the Polls kind of step in and educate. We make sure that we go into the neighborhoods, talk to neighborhood association presidents. We put things on social media just to remind people, hey, this is the last deadline to vote. This is the last day to update your voting information. This is the last day to do absentee um, voting. And, you know, something that I hate that our Secretary of State does is that he kind of says that absentee voting is early voting. It's not. That is not early voting. And I think, you know, with Alabama, the state of Alabama, why do we not have early voting or same-day voter registration? Why are we so fearful of that? So that's kind of why I say it's by design in a sense. Nora, do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, about racial anxiety, um, of course, that exists in the Hispanic population. I mean, it's the result of 
uh, some years of um, special hate against uh, immigrants and it's the result of a vision of some years ago where the boat defined how the country wanted to be nowadays. Mm -hmm. So, of course, there are citizens that are immigrants that are now citizens that are able to vote, but they are fearing that they are maybe confused by some by, by being undocumented. Mm -hmm. And if we see in the news that there are citizens. Hispanic citizens that have been uh, spending some time at the detention centers by mistake, of course you are going to be fearful to to go and vote. So I think one of the missions of OLA in the next elections is going to be have also an advocacy program to make sure that every citizen that goes and votes uh, is respected, that, mm -hmm. ha that can feel safe, that can continue with the process without being worried about having a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Good, thank you. More empowerment yes. around that. Nancy? Sure, well of course it was by design. We know that when we look at the evolution of our constitution from people of color in this country not even being recognized as human beings, then maybe you're three-fifths of a human being, or maybe you're a human being but you don't enjoy any rights. And then you have legally recognized rights that don't get enforced because you have Jim Crow and black codes and et cetera. So we know for sure just from that history that it's by design. I think the other thing is that we have to look at today the more insidious forms of voter suppression that we're dealing with that might not be the same to say you have to pay a dollar and fifty cents in order to vote. Now it's in order to get your rights restored, you person with a criminal conviction, you have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just packaged in a different way that unfortunately for a lot of our courts is more palatable, which is why we continue to struggle to strike these things down in the courts even though we're not giving up there, and which is why in terms of the policy front we really need to educate our politicians about the direct impact that there are people because of the way our society is structured who will never be able to satisfy these obligations and therefore will be permanently denied the right to vote, which means that the same group that our laws were supposed to protect are being disfranchised. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out how to disrupt that system if we are going to really get at the core of the racial motivations behind these kinds of laws. And then the other thing I just want to mention is that there, for sure, communities of color are the targets, but white rural voters are targets too. Mm -hmm. There are pockets mm -hmm. in this society, especially in the South, where you have white voters who actually want to live in a more progressive environment, but they themselves are being intimidated into voting the same way and choosing their race over their interests, their party over mm -hmm. their interests. So I don't pretend to be um, the best person to break up that cycle, but there has to be a constituency of people, probably who come from those communities, honestly, mm -hmm. who can figure out how to disrupt that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and speaking of the things, you know, kind of moving toward a bright light, right? We can see just a little bit of, of hope there. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about the um, Voting Rights Advancement Act. Um, and we know that it was introduced um, in response to um, uh, Shelby versus Holder and overturning that and what that would mean to Alabama specifically. So if you care to share that. Sure. So Representative Terry Sewell from Alabama has introduced the Voting Rights Advancement Act known as H.R. 4. And the idea is to put some teeth back behind Section 5 by creating a coverage formula to identify those who have continued to engage in bad practices when it comes to voting. I think there's no surprise that Alabama will remain on that list, as I think it should. Um, 
you know, I think the issue in terms of the VRAA, as we're calling it, is that for the first time in the history of the Voting Rights Act, there is not a single Republican sponsor on either side. A bill that has enjoyed bipartisan support since its enactment or even its proposal, a law that has, as many people recognize, been the most successful civil rights piece of legislation ever enacted, does not enjoy bipartisan partisan support. So for something that should be nonpartisan, like protecting the fundamental right to vote, is all of a sudden a partisan issue. And we have to dig really deep into why that is and say shame on you mm -hmm. to those people who refuse to support what should really be a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you. I know earlier um, when I, I did a TV segment, uh, I'm wearing this button that the future is us, right? And there is no us versus them. Because in, in, at the end of the day, we're all in this together, right? Although, you know, some people would have us to not believe that. But we are. We're all in that together. So let's shift gears before we go to um, our questions via live stream. What um, does healthy voting look like? So I have a few questions under that. Are there currently proven policies that increase turnout and empower voters in your area of expertise and all of your on the ground grassroots work? I mean, yes. Um, <laughs> give us hope, Kanisha. Give us hope. <laughs> so you kind of sense where my mind was going. Yes. Sir. Um. In a sense, yes. Um, like a, going back to just educating the electorate, if we do a better job about that, I think that also increases voter participation. Um, what we did in the last election cycle uh, was make sure we put information out about the candidates, information about deadlines, uh, voter restoration rights deadlines, and things like that. In terms of healthy voting, um, I think in some states there are things in place that conduces um, heavy voting. I think that Alabama could do better in some areas, but I think um, the voting practices, the healthy voting practices are coming more so from grassroots and partnering organizations, not so much on the state level, if that makes uh -huh. sense. Uh -huh. um, so I... I I may not be the best person to, to answer that because, you know, just kind of being on the ground, you see some things that are happening and it, it makes you kind of question, why is this happening, mm -hmm. you know, this day um, in 2019? Mm -hmm. So I think that we do have some strides to make. Um, gradually, I'm seeing um, improvement, but I do think that we have a ways to go on some things. Nancy. The question was optimism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Summarize it. Yes. <laughs> well, we're here, right? We're having this conversation. Yes. That is positive because that means we are the ones keeping the issue alive. So that's mm -hmm. a good thing. Um, and then there are, of course, places in the country like California. California mm -hmm. is not perfect, but they have same day voter registration. Uh -huh. They have a more uh -huh. progressive rights restoration scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, they have, you know, early voting, all of those things. So, again, Again, not that that is the, a perfect, perfect model because they also struggle in, in other areas. Mm -hmm. But we know, for example, it can be done. Mm -hmm. So the idea that some of these, I, you know, these suggestions are so far away into the future is not true when you have a number of places already doing mm -hmm. or enacting these policies. So that gives me hope. It mm -hmm. gives me hope that you know, there, there's a trend that's already developing. That means that our society is changing and some people are being essentially asked to get with the program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good, thank you. Nora? That's a good answer. Well, um, there are two main points that um, help me be optimistic about um, the elections and the voter registration and the participation. One is that there are new organizations that are working to educate. So we are, for example, Ola is collaborating with ICA and with ACIJ that they work mainly in Birmingham. 
we are creating a network to be able to cover a larger area and reach more people. So we are working in that process. We are um, getting to know some advocates and people that are, I will use like the expression of waking up and looking at what can be done to make things different. And the second is how the election of the mayor here in Montgomery like uh, turned out because uh -huh. it changed something that was happening for 200 years and yeah. then more people went out they uh, wanted to make their voice uh, noted and that that definitely gives me hope and i just want to mention that i will be also very happy in the if in the long term we could address hispanic specific topics or immigration specific topics such as the daca mm -hmm. because uh, there are yeah. a lot of pending oh, yeah. issues over there that are not mentioned yes. like it's not only about not having a a, a clear light or a clear path of where the life of these streamers are going mm -hmm. but also all that comes with that that is like not being a citizen then they are not able to vote and well they can really make a difference they are young people the average uh -huh. age is 24 25 age 80 percent of them are under 30 years old so I don't know, there are some pending issues that mm -hmm. we need to address at some point. Yeah, okay. So we'll, we're going to take questions from the audience. And when we come back, I do want to go back to this generational thing. That was one of my questions, but I'll ask you later. So we'll now transition, and we'll take our questions from social media. Okay, so we have one question uh, from Chris Eccles. Is there any advocacy in Alabama for automatic voter registration? Um, see, our senator sent <laughs> um, I was going to actually kind of point him out. Um, in recent years, there has been a bill to put in automatic voter registration um, as well as kind of implement early voting. Um, that has also been placed by the Democratic leaders um, in the House and the Senate. Unfortunately, going back to the um, political affiliation and size, uh, what you think would be a kind of a nonpartisan issue has actually been um, very partisan from my recollection in the last session. Um, the Republican majority did not back it, so it just kind of died um, in the legislature. But to my understanding, they will reintroduce the bill um, for this upcoming legislative session. All right, we've got another question from Chris. Is there anyone in the state of Alabama advocating for ranked choice voting as an effort to give people the feeling that their vote carries more weight? I am not aware of um, any move other than just picking one candidate that you want and that being your only mm -hmm. option. But for sure, there are other um, election schemes, I guess, that have enabled people to feel like if it's not their first choice, at least their second choice, et cetera, in terms of rank voting. There's also things like cumulative voting, which is kind of like you get a certain number of votes and you can spread them out or put them all behind one person. So there are definitely some other systems that can be considered, um, but I'm not aware of Alabama considering anything other than what we have right now. Question from Hugh Jordan. How do you hold an elected official accountable? Um, mainly, primarily, go to meetings. Um, if city council are having meetings and there is something that your elected official is not doing, show up and get on the agenda. Call your elected official. Email your elected official call your elected official out if they're not doing um, what they're supposed to do in, in, a, in a nice, normal way. But um, there are ways to kind of hold um, elected officials accountable. I just don't think that we as an electorate really do a good job of that. We kind of talk 
amongst each other about what elected officials aren't doing, but we rarely make that next step into notifying um, that elected official or that office um, what they're doing or what they're not doing. Um, I have seen more participation from the electorate in terms of going to meetings. Um, I know with my sorority, um, Delta Sigma Theta, um, we have set up a schedule that we send out to our members to notify them when the city council meeting is happening, when school board meetings are happening, um, counting commission. So when something comes up and they hear something that may not you know, sit well with them, then they communicate with us regarding whether we need to do a call to action. Um, example, with the recent panhandling ordinance. Um, we have been going to city council meeting here and that. Um, they're going to revisit that issue on tomorrow, tomorrow, and we're sending notification out to our groups to show up and speak up against this because it's something that's not, um, I don't think is representative of Montgomery and its people. So just things like that to kind of hold accountable. I think a lot of times laws are passed or ordinances are put in place because they don't hear from the public and by them not hearing from the public, they think it's okay. So, you know, it, it's ways to, to do that. Or misunderstanding mm -hmm. what people are proposing to is yes. another issue yes. um, that we've encountered on the ground. Mm -hmm. They just don't understand the language is complex right. um, mm -hmm. and having it broken down right. is very difficult. I'm the moderator. I um, well, yes, I will um, also mention something that if you are voting for someone or not voting for someone, it's because you believe or not in a project. So you have to make, if you vote it, you have to make sure that that person is um, fulfilling your expectations. And if not, if you don't, didn't vote for that person, then you have to make sure that it's... Um, having the right place because that person deserves that place. So my point is that at, we have to break the cycle of um, being out of the survival mode and not paying attention to politics and not paying attention to what is happening because sometimes we are very busy trying to solve the practical things of life and we disconnect from whatever happens after the election. So following up, breaking the cycle. If you elected someone, then follow up because the work of that person is going to uh, directly impact your life in the next years. Mm -hmm. And that is going to take you out to be able to do some other things and then build the civic uh, life in general. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nancy, did you want to add? Sure. I mean, I think about it also in the immigrant rights context where you have a lot of non-citizens, so they can't vote, but how can they still leverage whatever political part, you know, um, strength or civic engagement in terms of movement? And I think about it also, especially, of course, in the census context where there's been an effort in places like Texas and even at the national level through our president not to include non-citizens in our census count as mm -hmm. if we can ignore that a particular right. population exists. So I think again it, it is worth really strategizing about how you can leverage the power of people who, ca who can't directly vote someone into office but can still make sure that whoever is in office is doing things or en enacting policy that help everyone. Yeah. Thank you. So do we have questions from our guests in the audience? Surely I haven't asked everything that's on your mind. <laughs> First of all, thank you all so much. This has been really enlightening. Um, the question I had was I'm really interested in the relationship between debt and disenfranchisement. Mm -hmm. And I understand that SPLC was part of a recent consolidated case in Florida related to people being disenfranchised because of court debt, fines and fees. Um, and I read that there was an injunction that had stopped that. So I guess my question was first for Nancy, if you could speak to sort of your work on that case and sort of what the outlook is. Um, and then also I'd be interested, Kanisha and Nora, if you could speak to how you see 
debt-driven disenfranchisement showing up in your community-based work as well. I really appreciate it. Sure, thank you. So yes, SPLC is one of, of a number of organizations that has sued the state of Florida because after a historic ballot initiative passed known as Amendment 4 last November that re-enfranchised over 1.4 million people who have a felony conviction but who have otherwise completed their sentence, meaning prison, parole, probation, any community supervision that they're going under, all of that is done, that those folks would be eligible automatically to vote. And then the Florida legislature came back a couple of months later and redefined, as far as we're concerned, completion of sentence to mean also that you fully satisfied all of your court fines, fees, restitution, victim restitu restitution, um, anything that they could think of <laughs> that might be t even tangentially associated with your sentence. And for some people, like our clients, you're talking about $14,000, $7,500. Other people are facing a lot more in terms of what they owe. And some people a lot less, but they can't even afford that, especially when they're just trying to meet the demands of daily life. So we've sued the state arguing that that law is a poll tax because it literally is a requirement that you pay money in order to vote, that it's a form of wealth-based discrimination because only people who are of financial, certain financial means can meet that obligation and then vote. We've also really tried to highlight how confusing this whole process is. There are some people in the lawsuit, some plaintiffs who have been what they call off paper. They haven't been any un under any kind of supervision literally for decades. And so they don't even know that they owe money. Money, and oftentimes the county doesn't even know how much money they owe and yet they're supposed to figure that out in order to vote. And then the other thing that we've raised for SPLC is a 19th Amendment claim and really trying to recognize that you know we'll be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment which recognized the right of women to vote and yet we have a law that will have a disparate impact on women. We continue to make less money as we enter the workforce, and our numbers in terms of women and our representation in the criminal justice system is rapidly outpacing men. And then we come out and we have fewer prospects of employment. Mm -hmm. um, it's estimated that almost 44% of black women who exit the criminal justice system are unemployed. So then you ask that very population to pay money as a condition to vote and the result is clear. And then you couple that with the fact that as women we are a growing number of the electorate. We're outpacing men many times when it comes to voter registration and voter turnout out although you know our funding in terms of office is not as strong as men there are women who are being elected to office with the support of other women and so this is a very dangerous law that has the, a ripple effect on a lot of different populations so that's why we're trying to bring a holistic case to really highlight how insidious it is I don't have any, everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have um, we haven't addressed that uh, specific topic yet. Mm -hmm. Yes. The mic, Jill. Thank you. I, I think I'm noticing a shift nationwide, but I got to see it, Kanisha, with rolling to the polls over at ASU. Mm -hmm during the mayoral race that you folks are concentrating on the 18 to 24 year old mm -hmm. voting block that if people exercise their right to vote in that age group, mm -hmm. it would dramatically change mm -hmm. pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. um, I'm relatively new to Alabama. What are the rules that either help promote students getting involved mm -hmm. in using their right to vote or inhibit them? I know in California, you can vote where you go to school. In mm -hmm. some states, you can't vote where you go to school, mm -hmm. and then they specifically, or that you can use or not use school ID in places that need mm -hmm. photo ID. Mm -hmm. How does that play out here in Alabama, mm -hmm. and what are the things that 
both you're doing or that could be done to mm -hmm. facilitate people in that age group getting out and using their right to vote? Okay. Um, before I answer that question fully, um, the good thing about Alabama is that students can vote where they go to school and um, if they're, and I probably have to verify this, but I know if they're at a state university, then their ID can count um, as a form of ID. Um, but what I've noticed in dealing with um, younger voters or getting younger people to vote, and really this kind of goes with all um, ages of voters, you have to meet people where they are. Um, you have to identify issues that remotely they're, you know, they're remotely concerned about. Um, I know in talking to young voters, they're very concerned about student debt. They're very concerned about the economy when they graduate, how much debt they will incur, or if they or if the job market will be strong enough for them to have a job. Um, I noticed with the past um, election cycle, in trying to get them involved in the local election, um, a lot of them were concerned about the level of economic growth that was going on in Montgomery. A lot of them are already planning to move out of state because they don't feel like they can sustain a life or sustain a good job here in Montgomery. And they really wanted to hear from candidates to see what their plan would be for, you know, to, to increase the economy here. So basically really meeting them where they are and kind of correlating that to voting, um, by voting, this could help in this place that you're concerned about. We've noticed an increase of that. And then really primarily just going back to educating and engagement. I noticed a lot with political campaigns that political campaigns always tend to engage young voters last or not at all. Um, they focus on what they call their high porosity voters and they kind of consider younger voters, you know, low porosity, like they're, they're not going to be too engaged to go vote. They may be focused about something else. And depending on who you talk to, that can be true or not. I know when I was in college and school, I can't even remember when I voted. But because it was, you know, the farthest thing back in my mind, I did vote. But it wasn't a high priority as it would be now. So it really just kind of goes to really meeting them where they are, identify where their issues and concerns are, and connecting that to that power of voting. And we kind of, you know, noticed that in the last election cycle, once we started engaging them, we kept talking to them. We kept reaching out. Um, we connected with groups that were on campus and had some people who were volunteers within Rolling to the Polls to kind of connect with them. And also, um, in addition to Rolling to the Polls, there's another group, um, Organized Alabama, that really went out to AUM, really went out to other college campuses and engaged those voters as well by registering them to vote and keeping them engaged in the process. So, mm -hmm. Do I have another question from the audience? Thank you, Kenesha. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I want to commend Ms. Brown and also uh, the sorority for doing such an outstanding job. To what extent is this program being rolled out to fraternities and sororities mm -hmm. locally and nationally as part of their platform? Okay. Um, well, locally, I can say one of the reasons why we did not list it under our sorority per se um, and put it under the umbrella of Rolling to the Polls was so we could get more partnering organizations. Um, to work with us. Um, people that know me or I've worked with in the past know that I'm not about reinventing the wheel and I'm very big on collaboration and strength in numbers. I really don't care who gets recognition for <laughs> anything just as long as the work is getting done. And by having that perspective, we have partnered with other organizations. SPLC is a partner. Um, Legal Services Alabama is a partner. We partner with Organize Alabama and other sororities. Alpha Kappa Alpha has been very big and instrumental in helping us knock on doors and doing the ground grassroots work. Um, statewide, we're trying to push this into other areas. Um, we're actually having a volunteer training meeting um, on December the 7th where we're inviting other groups and other statewide groups to come in to get um, training on what we do so it can go um, elsewhere to other places. And if you're in the area, please come and join us. We'll have snacks. Um, 
So, you know, we are trying to expand it statewide, especially ahead of 2020. Um, and we're trying to push to make it as a national um, initiative with the sorority as well. So we're working on it. <laughs> Nancy, you drew a, a historic line of development that looked at voter disenfranchisement or hostility to black voting over time. And then, and, and I think, but <clears throat> one of the things I think you might have overlooked was then the, the, the Democratic Party in Alabama prior to the, the civil rights movement was predominant, overwhelmingly democratic. The, the Democratic Party was over, the white supremacists were in the Democratic Party. They renamed the party, um, and, and the, the logo was, was a rooster, white supremacy, for right was the logo. Um, and then with the Civil Rights Movement, that, that population shifts to the Republican Party, almost wholesale. So where, where prior to the Civil Rights Movement, you couldn't get elected in the state of Alabama if you were a Republican. And then after the civil rights movement, with, with, with very rare exceptions, you can't be elected at the statewide level unless you're you know, a Republican. Um, so, and, 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 but prior to the civil rights movement, that was, a, that was a clearly white supremacist underpinnings. And you all allude to that in today's environment. But I think it's more of a dominant factor in today's environment. You know, and I, and I look at the, the construct of this panel, what, what, you know, if there was an attempt to um, include a Republican or, or someone, a conservative, and I, I, would, I would be, I, I would wonder if there was a Republican or a conservative who supports expanding voting rights for people of color or for, or any, for Americans. And so, so I think that we talk around this issue, but I think it's the, it's the, mo it's the core issue. Um, so that's just my observation. You could address it if, if you see fit. Absolutely. I really appreciate that observation because you're right. We cannot ignore the fact that the suppression of voters historically has been from both parties and other parties as they've existed over time. So you had a situation where, yeah, Democrats could get elected, but never a black Democrat. So that is why I really value the language when you're looking at the Voting Rights Act in a particular provision known as Section 2. And this is the idea that you can't deny or dilute someone's right to vote based on their race or their color, which means that it's not about electing a Democrat to power. It's about electing a candidate of choice and looking behind the R or the D to make sure that whoever is elected is, is in, in line with your agenda, with your social policies. And so you're absolutely right. And we know that even recently when we look at the partisan gerrymandering cases that have come out of the U.S. Supreme Court, mm -hmm. the one that we were really hoping that the court would finally take up in a substantive way and give us a workable legal standard that we could apply when deciding whether or not a particular plan has gone too far when it comes to considering partisanship, the Supreme Court absolutely absolutely wiped its hands of, of taking us up on that offer. And that case was really ideal because it was a consolidated case involving both the Republican Party in North Carolina and its shenanigans and the Democratic Party in Maryland and its shenanigans. Two opposite political parties that took a look at the political landscape and decided that they were going to enact plans to maximize their power, not to advance the agenda of the voters, but to make sure that, again, in North Carolina, Democrat can't get elected, and in Maryland, a Republican will never have a chance, a real chance. And so you're right. We have to look beyond party because there are problems with, with both of the ma majority ones in office today. And just another note, um, this event is sponsored by Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So it was intentional that we did not invite political 
wheels, Republican or Democrat. Our focus was on those who were doing work in the community um, to address voter um, suppression. So this, and they just happened to be all women. No. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that was, in, that was um, just to answer that part of the question as well. Thank you, Nancy. We have a question here. Um, we have two. Okay. Um, I'm really kind of new to politics, even though I've been involved for many, many years. But, I mean, you know a lot of the structure and that type of thing. But how different is um, when you... Um, enact the laws for uh, what we're doing uh, on voting and that sort of thing, or suppression, and is in the states, and how much is it federally taken care of? Nancy? Or well, I would say that election reform is probably most effective at the state or local level, which is why we continue to be engaged at the various legislative sessions, including in Alabama. But we know that there are certain situations where a federal federal response is necessary, and the Voting Rights Act is an example of that. We're also trying to push for federal fixes when it comes to absentee balloting and early voting. Um, we saw that once the federal government put requirements when it came to federal elections, then the states complied because it was too cumbersome to have two voting schemes in effect, one for federal, one for state. So the federal led the way and the states complied. And so, again, in certain situations, especially in Alabama, which has expressed through our Secretary of State absolute opposition to early voting, absolute opposition to no excuse um, absentee voting, absolute opposition to really educating people with criminal convictions of their voting rights, that we still need federal protections in place for everyone. Yes, well, I will also like to comment that, of course, um, I think that here in Alabama, like the state action is very important because Alabama is considered as a blocker for the votes. I mean, like not having vote by mail and absentee voting, ability to vote in primary um, if you are 18 by the general election, voting rights restoration, no res like the ID requirements per your station, same day voter registration, like Alabama is blocking almost everything. So, um, and most of these um, restrictions were pushed by one, one specific party. So I wonder also if that party wants people to vote or not. And well, I think like looking at the reforms at the state level is extremely important for Alabama and specifically by counties, no? Mm -hmm. One question in the back. Yes, um, how have your organizations in, engaged the Latino vote or um, other immigrant communities like the Asian community or Middle Eastern community? And for someone who has recently moved to the area, how can somebody that speaks Spanish uh, be involved or get involved with those efforts? Um, today in the morning, I was having a conversation with Melissa Freeland, that is the president of our board in Ola. And we were discussing something that we found at the, um, at some grants that they ask a question like, do you discriminate on base of origin or nationality? Because we are an Hispanic organization. So maybe, of course, we do not discriminate, uh, but we were wondering if at some point a company or an organization could have that perception that we do not outreach uh, people that are non-Hispanic. Uh, no, of course we, we do that. We have to focus our work in one population because there's so much to do. But uh, we want to connect with uh, some other immigrants at the very end. The laws that are affecting the Hispanics are also affecting some other populations. As an interpreter, I have also been um, visiting detention centers, and we find there people from Africa, we find there people from South America, we find like 
hundreds of immigrants that do not speak Spanish. In my case, I am a recent immigrant, so what I did as just to get involved was to go outside. Fortunately, I found Ola uh, one year ago, and I was able to engage with, um, with the organization and to start the work. So um, I think that about the immigrant, the work with immigrants and regardless of race, religion, or origin, what we have to worry about is addressing the human rights concerns, the civic rights concerns, and providing language access regardless of the language, and just looking at um, everyone as a human being and as someone that has needs and rights and voice. Kanisha. Um, <clears throat> I would say, honestly, um, about two election cycles ago, it didn't really hit that we weren't engaging um, the Hispanic community like we should. Uh, we kind of stumbled across it when we were out canvassing and we came into an area in Montgomery that was a large Hispanic uh, population. And of course, we did not really fully engage like we should have because of language barriers. And then when we started crunching numbers ahead of the municipal election, we noticed that the voting percentage among that community was extremely low compared to the full population in the area. I wanna say they are, the Hispanic community was roughly um, less than 3% registered voters. Um, and, and we were kind of shocked and we was very concerned about it. So we did reach out to Melissa with Ola Montgomery and we have been to a couple of their meetings and we're actually, they're now a partner. We're going to the polls, so we're going to work on making sure that we have information available to them that is transcribed um, in Spanish and um, other languages that are here. Because to my understanding, as I'm learning, there are different pockets of different um, nationalities within the community. Mm -hmm. So we're working on trying to get all of that, you know, transcribed correctly for them to get them registered and to get them engaged. Because what I've noticed that there hasn't been a lot of engagement um, with them at all. And like I said, it's very frustrating because they have a very large population here in Montgomery and they're kind of hidden in unheard. And that's, that's not right or fair. So in a short answer, <laughs> we're working on it, and we'll, we're gonna we're gonna get it together. So, okay. Nancy, sure. So, when the SPLC's voting rights practice group started in February, one of the first things that we did was join the voices of a number of other organizations and pushing back against President Trump's effort to include a citizenship question on the census form. And we were successful. Again, a lot of other groups involved in really leading that effort, but putting our voice behind that. And then after that, seeing how President Trump then came up with other ways to try to get the same information, the most recent um, version of that being asking Department of Motor Vehicles to provide information about citizenship of uh, motorists, so pushing back against that. And then also really trying to partner with other organizations in the immigrants' rights field. But even internally, we have a very strong immigrant justice practice group. And they've been representing a lot of communities and asylum seekers and providing direct services. So we're trying to partner internally to make sure that when we come to communities and we say trust us and fill out the census form because this is why it's important that we then have our immigrant justice attorneys right there with us to provide holistic service so that they know that we will be there to protect them if ICE does come knocking on their door or if local law enforcement starts using the census process as a way to identify people whose status might be questioned 
happened here in the United States. So that's another thing that we're doing. Um, we're for sure trying to implement what we're asking the government to do by translating our materials into not just Spanish, but Creole when you're talking about South Florida and the Haitian community. Um, Native American languages in an indigenous community that's not thought of very much at all. And in fact, I should have mentioned that in addition to the Voting Rights Advancement Act, there's also the Native American Voting mm -hmm. Rights Act. And that is an effort to give tribes more authority and autonomy when it comes to how elections are run in their communities. And so that's some of the work that we're doing, but it definitely won't be the end. Do you have any more questions from the audience or from our live stream? Okay. Well, in closing, if each panelist um, looking forward, you all have shared a lot of great information with us, um, concerns. Um, I'm hopeful, a little bit more hopeful than I was this morning, so that's a good thing. Um, but looking forward, if each of you could tell us um, one thing one thing as we prepare for 2020 um, and again keeping in mind that the future is all of us what is something what is one um, thing that you want to encourage our community our audience that's look, looking from all over um, and specifically those of us who are here in the south as we look forward <laughs> Kanisha um, I just don't want it to be a repeat of 2016. And, and when I say that, I think that we got so caught up in the media and in the polling. Um, we kind of allowed it to kind of slant our perception of what the election was going to look like. Um, it convinced some people to stay at home because they thought that one candidate already had it and their vote didn't count. Or the media kind of put such a negative image of a candidate to where it was like well either one of them will be evil so it doesn't matter if I vote or not um, I do want people to pay attention to the candidates on both sides what they're talking about what kind of plans they're going to instill um, how would it benefit you as a voter and pay attention really to what they're saying also pay attention to what's going on and even though I just spoke against the media but also do kind of pay attention <laughs> to to some of the reputable news sites um, of what's being said uh, what's going on um, in the administration um, I think that we kind of really need to pay attention to that and I think we need to move away from voting against our interests because of who we think is electable and who isn't um, and, and that's something that's been starting to repeat a lot about who is considered electable and who isn't. Um, and I think that's kind of skewed and slanted as well. So um, I, I don't want us to get so caught up in polling, really, because right now polling is out saying who's at the top and who's polling how. We're like, what, 200 days away mm -hmm. from, you know, yeah. primary. So I was like, you know, who who's really paying attention to polling? Who's really paying attention to you know, debates per se right now. You, you should, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but I, I just think that have more of a respectable way to pay attention to what's being said and just kind of discern through the rhetoric or whatnot. Nancy? Sure, well, I would say in response for everyone when it comes to election protection to pick one. Yes. Not everybody is a door knocker or a canvasser, but you can pick up a phone and take a list of 50 people and call them over an hour and say, this is election day, don't forget to vote. Um, if you have a vehicle, you can provide a number of folks a ride to the polls as yes. Rolling to the Polls is doing. Um, if you are an attorney and you live in New York or Ohio, but you care about what's happening here in the South, you can still lend your expertise in terms of legal research and writing, in terms of giving us a bank of documents that we can 
tap into and be ready to go as soon as someone's being denied the right to vote on that particular election day. And then another thing is you can just talk, like share what you learned today and spread that around so that we can get a, a br more people engaged in this dialogue about why voting really matters. So we're all tapped in terms of just exhausted and stretched, but we can all pick one and run with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nora? Well, I will say uh, specifically, uh, specifically to the Hispanic population that uh, it is important for you to engage. I will like to give the precise example of Texas. Texas has now 55% of the population that is Hispanic. In 2012, when there were elections, only 38% of the population that was registered to vote it, voted. To vote, voted. So um, recognize like uh, the power that you have as a community. Recognize what is happening in the border. Recognize uh, what the situation of fear is uh, being built so far. And also, if you do not belong to the Hispanic community, acknowledge that the hate that is directed towards one a specific population can just easily move, easily change. Uh -huh. No, we, uh, women has been uh, having a target. Um, a specific races, a specific religions. So the fact that you are not being attacked right now doesn't mean that you cannot, uh, you are like free of every kind of uh, oppression. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's look at the situation of our neighbors. Let's look at what we have in front of us and engage. Like mainly the vote is the only power that, the real power that we have mm -hmm. as society. Uh, there are so many things that are outside of our control, circumstances that we cannot change, but electing our representatives is something that we can do. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nora. And you just closed us out. <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. For those of you who joined us via live stream, we really appreciate you for doing that. And just remember, your vote is your voice. Your vote is your voice. And voting is a necessity. It is necessary. Um, and I am hopeful. I hope you are hopeful. I hope you are energized. And I hope you all will join us tomorrow, for those of you who are in the audience, for our Day of Remembrance that will begin at 11.30 a.m. out front of the Civil Rights Memorial Center. Thank you all so much. Have a good night. Thank you.